your game as an executive of an organization doing extremely well. Let's imagine for a second that you're at the top of your game as an executive of an organization doing extremely well. But in today's litigious society with uh, with plaintiff's attorneys, they're looking for personal negligence when it comes to business decisions. Today, we're going to talk about a program that is designed to protect not only the balance sheet of your organization, but also your own personal liability from decision-making processes as a C-suite individual. Hello, and welcome back to the uh, Risk GovCon podcast. I'm your host, Brian Smith, and today I'm really excited to have a wonderful individual in studio today. His name is actually Dick Clark, and Dick and I have known each other now for, for 20 years. He's a personal friend and an industry expert in the property and liability insurance arena. And he has done the cycle, so to speak, in the insurance world, where he's done work as an underwriter, a broker, and now he's a consultant. So in short, he really has seen it all. Before retiring three years ago, he was a senior vice president for a Southeast regional insurance brokerage called J. Smith Lanier. And now they have since been purchased by Marsh, so they have a new name now. And he's also an author, an educator, and he serves as an expert witness in the area of what we're going to talk about today, that being executive liability. Most recently, Dick authored the Executive Liability Insurance book, From the Basics to an Advanced Approach, which is actually available on Amazon.com. But he's doing a re-edit, so the sixth edition is going to be coming out either late 2019, early 2020. So in the link below, you're going to be able to identify that book and have an opportunity to go to it and take a look at it. But lastly, he is recognized in the risk management field as a distinguished insurance instructor. In other words, this guy just keeps going and going and going. I'm really, really glad today to have Dick Clark as our expert guest for the Risk GovCon podcast. Dick, it's it's good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you too, Brian. Always glad to be with you and to share uh, knowledge and experience. Well, we've got a lot of things that we want to cover today, and I know that your knowledge and experience is going to do, I think, the C-suite individuals that are listening to this podcast a, a great deal of benefit. I think they're going to get a lot out of this today because we're going to talk about something that I believe is near and dear to your heart and a lot of other insurance professionals when it comes to figuring out the best way to protect their clients' balance sheets and also not only reputation, but the likelihood of, of what would happen if we had an issue with the directors or officers on someone's board. Does that, that make sense? That's uh, absolutely correct. Tell me a little bit about what we're going to cover today and how we're going to go about doing that. Because I know we're going to end at, at the end of the segment, five things to consider. But in the interim, what is it that you really want to cover for us? I think the uh, importance of directors and officers liability insurance for the individual. If you're a, a decision maker within an organization, then you're exposing your personal assets in a society where when something goes wrong, plaintiff attorneys look to attach blame. Knowing that you have an insurance policy that's going to be there to protect you in the event there is personal negligence alleged against you is probably pretty important. One of the reasons I asked you to come in was about False Claims Act. I had originally thought that this would have been a good protection for an allegation, even defense with the Department of Justice during an investigation. But you had mentioned to me that through some research that that may not always be the case. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I think a real important aspect of DNO insurance coverage is responding to allegations from a variety of sources. Being able to have insurance coverage that would respond to allegations from a regulator is very important. And so at a minimum, you'd want a DNO policy that does not have a regulatory exclusion. If you could get an affirmative statement that, that there was coverage for regulatory defense expenses, that would be better. Now, not every minimum limit, minimum premium, minimum retention DNO policy and the underwriters thereof are going to be willing to provide that coverage. So it takes a fairly skillful broker to arrange that coverage. But I think the core issue when you talk about False Claims Act, the bigger issue there is probably having some degree of coverage that responds to allegations made by regulators. You mentioned that it, it may be kind of difficult to get 
Can you go through that a little bit for me and why they may say, oh, we don't think we want to do it? Yeah, I think there's a correlation in the world of DNO insurance coverage between the amount of money, the limits thereof for a DNO policy, and the per claim retention amount. Underwriters don't want to just throw out there a million dollar limit policy with a $5,000 deductible and have it cover the world. Now, on the other hand, if you've got an organization that shows it's serious about the coverage and is willing to purchase a limit of $5 million or $10 million, which is going to involve some premium, and is willing to assume a certain amount of the risk itself via the per claim retention amount, then underwriters are much more open to negotiation. And any, I think when you look at a given exposure, there are two aspects to it. There's coverage for settlements and judgments. And then there's coverage for defense expenses. So the underwriter might say, I'm not willing to provide coverage for settlements and judgments, but I'll give you a sublimit for defense expenses. So it it takes really a a kind of a thorough approach as opposed to, well, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater because we've got this exclusion on the policy for uh, defense expense, uh, for defense, uh, excuse me, uh, allegations brought by regulators. So I think that's uh, there's several ways to approach it. False Claims Act, I think, is one example of a statute, a law that is there that is designed to punish those people who make, obviously, who make mistakes in handling it. So I think having a broader approach, which would be coverage to respond to defense of allegations brought by regulators would be a good way to do it. A good broker who has lots of leverage with underwriters and specializes in a certain business type is likely to be able to arrange that because that constitutes leverage and leverage in this market for DNO insurance is critically important. Well, that's one, that's obviously one aspect of it with regards to the False Claims Act, but just when we were doing our, our pre-discussion before the show today, we were talking about a couple of other different claim scenarios, but could you bring up another example, for instance, that uh, outside of the False Claims Act that our audience may be interested in from a claims perspective on what they can look at? I think if you look at current events, the things that happen that make the news and then understand the connection between those current events and DNO insurance coverage, that can be real helpful. So let's just take one as an example of a large organization, the Boeing Company, very, very successful in uh, airplane technology, aerospace technology. It's revealed that they have a model of their plane that apparently has some issues with it because there were two serious crashes that happened, one at the end of 2018, another one earlier this year. And so as a result of that, they and it's after some discussion, they don't do it willingly, but they ground the model of that airplane. Facing some significant litigation from those crashes, they then come out and say, well, maybe we didn't do such a good job in relaying the actual software operation to airlines and pilots. And so that constitutes some potential negligence that plaintiff attorneys will seize on and look for ways to make allegations. DNO insurance is about addressing the decision making function, the governance function. And so a DNO policy, uh, subject to its limits, subject to its retention amounts, should respond to that kind of negligence. When you put it that way, I can't see why somebody's ears wouldn't perk up about. Uh about looking at some of the stuff because those decisions that are being made on a daily basis could obviously have an impact that are far reaching. And you're talking about Boeing and, and, and what I find in many cases is that people think not me, not us, it's not going to happen to us. And that's one of the areas that I try to cover with people and my colleagues as well. Like this is what you may want to consider the, Boeing example, I think, is, is, is really a good one. We can get into a variety of other examples, but instead of doing that, let's talk a little bit about, you and I had made mention of, uh, I asked you about, let's say that a, a prime got rid of a, uh, they, they cut ties with a subcontractor. There was an agreement in place, and they decided that the work was not being done well. They've got good documentation on it. The results of their performance have been poor. And that prime or even that subcontractor that has another subcontractor has decided to remove them from the work. 
how would a DNO policy, a director's and officer's policy, respond? Because that was obviously a decision made at the highest level of the organization. Would you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the critical issue there, Brian, is exactly what the allegations are. There are allegations that a plaintiff attorney could make that would trigger DNO insurance coverage, and then there are allegations that a plaintiff attorney could make that would not trigger DNO insurance coverage. If the allegation is blatant discrimination on some basis pertaining to the subcontractor, then uh, that could go either way. That could be covered under a DNO policy or perhaps not. It just everything rests with the allegations. You know, in the Boeing example. If, if the allegation is that Boeing didn't share certain information that it had, that's clearly DNO. But there, it, it just everything depends upon what the, how the plaintiff attorney styles the allegation. It all, everything really rests critically on that. That's, it makes a lot of sense. Everything has to rest on what the allegations are and then how the policy is going to respond. At this point, let's go ahead and take a brief break in the conversation, and we'll be back with you in just a second. As a government or defense contractor, you know insurance requirements can be different and sometimes challenging more than standard commercial business operations. So why place your risk in the hands of a commercial insurance agent with little or no experience in your unique operations? Entrusting your coverage needs to the right insurance team saves time, money, and resources. The Insurance Office of America Government Contracting Team manages client needs for Defense Base Act insurance, proposal rate development, and multi-state workers' compensation programs, just to name a few. Interested in learning more? Contact Brian Smith for additional details and whether our skills can meet or exceed your expectations. IOA Government and Defense Contracting Practice. We have your back. What we wanted to make sure that we got back to doing is talking about a possible claim scenario if you are a prime and you let go a subcontractor or someone that's in the chain, so to speak, that's doing the work for you. And so just prior to the break, we were talking about that. So, Dick, would you go into maybe a scenario or two that could specifically address that to our audience today? Because that's probably going to be one of the main areas that they're going to be faced with. Sure, Brian. So a subcontractor who's released from responsibility by a prime contractor, no real damage to the prime contractor if there's no litigation. But if the subcontractor says to the prime contractor, you didn't have a true basis for releasing me, you just had somebody else you wanted to insert into this role as a subcontractor, that could potentially be allegations if it's formalized into a demand or a lawsuit. That could formally be something that could be covered by a DNO policy. Now, it might not be. It depends upon exactly what the plaintiff attorney alleges. Discrimination, harassment could conceivably be covered if that's a provable situation. Merely dismissing a subcontractor just for cause is probably not going to be something that would be uh, covered. There'd have to be an allegation of some form of negligence on the part of the, the prime. And I guess what the, what I'm getting at here was that, um, let's just say that the prime, they're upset. They're, they, they went and filed a claim. They are not a claim, but they filed a petition with an attorney, and the, atter- petition, the attorney brought the lawsuit forward. Would a DNO policy at least defend in that case to, in order to uncover whether or not there was actually a wrongdoing? I would say the chances are pretty good of getting defense, but again, it depends upon exactly what the plaintiff attorney alleges. Now, if the plaintiff attorney tries to color up the allegations or the demand by using terms like conspiracy, fraud, those kinds of things, that's going to be very difficult for any insurance policy to respond to. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, depending upon the circumstances, it could respond to that. Okay, that makes sense. It always seems like everything is conditional. I guess the most important thing is, and I'll, I'll, I just want to insert this here, is if you're responsible for your insurance program, I always try to leave this person or this, th- that person with this advice. Read your exclusions. Even if you don't read anything else on your policy, read what's not covered on your policy. It'll tell you in there. And in some cases, if you don't understand it, which you, don't, you, you may not, because we couldn't do what you do financially. We couldn't do from a leadership perspective what your tasks with every day as a CFO, a CEO, a controller, 
that's a respectful role. We, we can't do what you do because the insurance professions professionals work in, a, in the arena of every day. They should be able to explain that to you. Have a look at your exclusions. I think that's really, really important. For guests on executive liability, Dick Clark, and we are just got through talking about a few claim scenarios that are related to this particular coverage. And I think one of the key things to consider here is how experienced is your team on handling something like this? Are you prepared for it? And also the insurance professional that you trusted with your work, how confident are you in their ability to understand what we just covered here? Because that's really, really important, which is one of the reasons that I present this Risk GovCon podcast is because my team works exclusively in this space. Think about who you're using. When you're looking at some of these things, it's important that you partner with the right team. Well, moving right along, now we want to get into the second part of our show where we're going to talk about five things to consider whenever you are looking at or you're being, you're having a discussion about executive liability. So Dick, let's go ahead and get started with number one. Yeah, I think it's very important for decision makers to understand how corporate bylaws, which incidentally are not required, and the indemnification clause in the corporate bylaws, which is also not required but very important, how that relates to DNO insurance coverage. The indemnification clause is the company's, the employer's, the organization's promise that they will indemnify, make whole again, those individuals if they incur defense expenses in defending themselves or if they pay settlements or judgments. That's a real important aspect. And the way that coordinates with DNO insurance is this. The DNO policy typically has three insuring agreements. Insuring agreement one or insuring agreement A is coverage for the directors and officers, and oftentimes in private companies and nonprofit organizations, the policy includes employees, which Mm -hmm. may or may not be a favorable aspect. But insuring agreement one covers those things which are not indemnifiable. Well, if the indemnification clause is broad, what's an example of something that would not be indemnifiable? One obvious example is the company doesn't have enough money in the treasury to fulfill that promise of indemnification. That's true for smaller organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, that kind of thing. So there may not be enough money in the corporate treasury to fulfill the promise of indemnification. Therefore, that first insuring agreement becomes extremely important. Insuring agreement two, or B, replenishes the corporate treasury after money has been taken out to fulfill that promise of indemnification. So you can readily see if you don't have DNO insurance coverage or you don't have enough, then there's going to be a shortage of money in that equation. And then insuring agreement three is coverage for the entity and all subsidiaries understanding what the corporate structure of the organization is is very important. There should be automatic coverage for any organization that is more than 50% owned or controlled, but there wouldn't be any automatic coverage for a 50-50 joint venture, a 40-60 joint venture uh, partnership, something like that. So that issue is very important, and I put that at the top of the list because if you're a C-suite executive and you can understand that and understand that relationship, then you'll readily understand how important DNO insurance coverage is. Let's get into number two. Number two is very important because the broker must have leverage to get things done. The more knowledgeable and experienced the broker is, the the wider the broker's influence is in terms of different risks and different underwriters, then the easier it is for the broker to get something done. Specialization is very important. And a broker who specializes would be a broker that you'd want to go to as opposed to somebody who's selling insurance and this is just a one-off situation for them. So I think that's uh, extremely important. It's more important now, and this leads us into another one of those important aspects, because the market is firming. So this is now number three. Yeah, we've, we've segued into number three. So the market is firming. Underwriters are saying, look, we're really looking closely at risks. 
Uh, we're not willing to maintain the status quo, whatever the premium was last year, assuming it's still an acceptable risk, we're going to want an increase. And that's a situation that is being faced by all brokers. So that leverage in a tough market or in a firming market becomes extremely important. Number four. Yeah, number four, um, it's important to understand what's excluded. And of course, in a basic policy, there's going to be uh, certain exclusions. There will be exclusions that will be added by endorsement. It's, it's very important for both the seller as well as the buyer to understand the excluded exposure and to overlay that with what the organization is actually doing. Number five. Yeah, number five, the knowledge issue is very important on a new business application. There's an ambiguously worded question that every insurance carrier is going to ask on a new business application that relates to knowledge by any person proposed for the insurance. So you can see that if employees are covered in in addition to decision makers, then there's a, a trick with that question. Underwriters want a very finite answer. They don't want you to say, well, maybe. They want a yes or a no. And if the answer is yes, yes, there are situations that might give rise to a claim, then many underwriters are going to say, I'm sorry, it just doesn't meet our minimum underwriting standards. So the preferred answer is no. There's no getting around that on a new business application. But the knowledgeable insurance broker will avoid using new business applications even when a new insurer is involved unless it's the first time that the organization is purchasing DNO insurance coverage. So there's really a, a connection between all of these issues that relates to the skill, the knowledge, the ability, the experience of the insurance broker, and how that insurance broker can get the best possible deal, meaning maximum coverage at minimum cost for uh, his clients or her clients. We have had a wonderful discussion with Mr. Dick Clark today. Again, he is the author of a a wonderful book called Executive Liability Insurance, From the Basics to an Advanced Approach, which is available on Amazon.com. But again, it's coming out in the sixth edition, which will be released later 2019, early 2020. And with that, thank you so much for your time today and glad you listened in to the Risk GovCon podcast. I'm your host, Brian Smith. Hello, government contractors. This is Brian Smith with the Risk GovCon podcast, and I've got a question for you. How long did it take your current or past insurance professional to understand the GovCon world you experience every day? Or are they still trying to figure it out? It may be time to consider the experts with the Insurance Office of America. Our blend of military experience, risk management techniques, and insurance knowledge creates a second-to-none GovCon client experience. We reduce CFO stress and anxiety by exercising our capabilities as your in-house risk management team on insurance renewals, information gathering, and comprehensive insurance program creation. We actually embrace challenging OCONUS operations, multi-state contracts, and the wide variety of contract awards that you may win because our insurance partners have the confidence in our understanding of your risks. Interested in learning more? Visit the website at theriskrecon.com. That's T-H-E. R-I-S-K-R-E-C-O-N dot com for more details. We can start a conversation and eventually bring an end to all those insurance woes. It might be time to change. <music>